Now, I don't know if that's Jessica Walker, but I'm about to find out. And here is the communications and campaign manager for Consumer. So, Jessica, is that you or not? Vacuum testing. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So are you the Consumer Institute that does that sort of stuff or are you a different organisation and, and, uh, uh, altogether? Uh, no, so we were the Consumers Institute and now we're Consumer New Zealand and testing is still very much part of what we are known for, I think, amongst <coughs> a, a great number of New Zealanders now as far as test results. But we're also, you know, very interested in advocacy and issues that impact consumers, so things like are the supermarkets ripping us off? Are we being misled by manufacturers with greenwashing? And more and more, we're talking about scams and whether the banks could be doing more to protect us. So okay, now that's good. So you're the same organisation that I subscribe to. I'm a member of your organisation. Yeah, yes. yeah. So you're reliant oh, upon my income, are you? Do you, are you reliant upon me to join, to, to give you a job? Pretty much. Um, oh. Yeah, our, our members... You know, they keep us going. They're our lifeblood. Without the members, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So, yeah, we value each and every single one of them. Um, good on you. I feel valued. No. Behind our campaigns. Oh, good. You should. Yeah. We, uh, well, we can I ask grateful. a question? How many of the army? Uh, how many? Uh, roughly, how many members have you got? That's a really good question, and I know that I should know that. Um, we still have a, a, a good number of members, but, you know, <coughs> sadly, what we're finding is our membership is in decline because, you know, this cost of living crisis, so people are having to make cuts and subscriptions are one of the first things to go. So, you know, we know that people look at their, their streaming platforms, but also the magazines and, and memberships that they're part of because, you know, right now every little helps, doesn't it? So, sadly, mm. we are seeing our membership declining. Are you based in Wellington, are you? <coughs> yeah, we are based in Wellington, but we have writers all around the country. So we've got people down south, up in Auckland. We've got people in Gisborne. So um, we've got we've got the country pretty much covered, but the vast majority of us are, are here in Wellington. All right. Okay. So you're the same organisation. That's great. That's fantastic. Good. Um, yeah. And as I said, I, I, I subscribe to you. So um, that's, that's excellent. But I was just saying about vacuum cleaners, because you've just done the vacuum cleaners one that's just come out. And... They, there's none of them are good. I mean, I don't. No, I, I'm not, I'm not, it's not your fault. But I'm just. There's something wrong with vacuum cleaners in this country. Do you have one at home? Which oh, what what goodness. what brand do you have? I have got a Hoover, um. um, and I've had it a long time now, and it's definitely time that I that I upgraded. But they're just so expensive, aren't they? They are. I think. Yeah. I can't yeah. really warrant it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm the same way. I, I, I was stunned by how expensive they are. In fact, you probably can't get a decent one for under a thousand bucks. It's ridiculous. Um, all right, now, no, moving on. Do you know what I love is every now and again, sorry, every now and again, our test results will throw up something that you know, <clears> might be a Kmart or a warehouse find and you think, oh my goodness, you know, it was $200 and it performs as well as, say, a Dyson. Um, you know, if things like that happen, then um, that, that's, that's what I'm always looking out for, test results for. Where, where can I save some money? Yeah. yeah, no, no, good on you. All right, now... Um, Bank scams. One of the things that I have been watching is the number of New Zealanders who have either got been through bank scams, either investments in the cryptocurrencies or just ordinary investments overseas, or alternatively, they've been the subject of some sort of Nigerian romance scam. And I have to be honest with you, like most New Zealanders, I haven't had a lot of sympathy because I go, oh, well, you were stupid enough to do that, so, you know, a fool and their money easily parted. So it's the old sort of fashion uh, concept of that. Until this time last year, I got a text on my phone at 5.30 on a Friday night from the Bank of New Zealand saying that there was a problem with my account and could I check, please, uh, with them and it was urgent. Uh, and I assumed, therefore, that somebody was raiding my bank account and that if I plugged in my details, um, I could talk to X about this particular problem with my account. And, so it, and, and then I suddenly did a second test and went, uh oh, I don't, it is a scam. But I was convinced initially it was from the Bank of New Zealand. Are you striking more of those sorts of people, Jessica? 
Absolutely we are. So this is something that we are increasingly concerned about. So we've been doing some nationally representative research. We wanted to get a bit of a feel for how big the scale of the problem is. And what we found is that in the last year alone, over half of New Zealanders have been targeted by a scam, which won't come as a surprise. But what might surprise you and your listeners is that one in 10 have actually lost money to a scam. And I think the problem is exactly what you were talking about there is, you know, it used to be we would look out for dodgy emails from Nigerian princes who just wanted to have our bank account details so that we could hold some money for them. Whereas now we're getting inundated with emails and text messages, even phone calls that look like they're coming from your bank. It looks like the real deal. So it's so hard to tell what is and, and isn't legitimate. And what we have to remember is these are, these are criminals. These are really sophisticated criminals and they're finding ways to, to get us. And what international research has shown is exactly what you just said, that it, a kind of sense of urgency, you need to act now, you need to give us your details now. And most of the people that are falling victim to scams are actually busy people. They're busy, intelligent people who see the message, panic, think, oh my goodness, <clears throat> someone is in my bank account, quick, I'll make that call, I'll, I'll click the link. And and that's when, that's when people are losing serious sums of money. Um, and yeah. it's, it's really quite frightening. It is. Now, um, I also have caught up with, and so as a result of that, um, for, yes, it would have happened about May of last year, I thought, oh, I'm going to keep an eye on this because I, I need to re-examine my particular dismissive attitude. But then I yeah. saw my dismissive attitude uh, being reproduced by the banking ombudsman um, who essentially right. said, well, caveat emptor, when certain people went and said, well, th these banks seem culpable to us in, in aiding and abetting these criminals and the way in which they conduct themselves. Um, you, were you disappointed with that response from the banking ombudsman or do you think that their general view of Campy at MTOR still holds sway in 2024? I think what we have to remember, and, and it is particularly troubling, is that here in New Zealand, there are now laws that requiring um, banks to reimburse scam victims. So what there actually is, is this voluntary code of practice which, which the banks have kind of a voluntary sign up to It's self regulatory And that means that if somebody is to steal your credit card or nick your wallet and go on a spending spree, then chances are, providing you haven't, you know, left your wallet somewhere with your number attached to your card, then chances are you're going to be covered. But in all other circumstances, so if you're tricked into into parting with your money, no matter how good that that, um, that trick looks, it could look exactly like your bank account that you're dealing with, but you're actually giving your detail to these what we call invisible criminals, then um, then under current laws you've um, the rules, you've got no protection. And with the ombudsman, they have to just check and see whether the bank has has applied by by these rules. And because the rules are so flimsy, in essence, the, the ombudsman is really hamstrung. And so we do have quite a lot of sympathy for the fact that that the rules are just they're just not good enough to protect us. And then the ombudsman is kind of tasked with trying to enforce these really flimsy rules when what we need is just greater protections across the board. Okay, so the banking ombudsman can't do their job properly because you're saying that the code that they're applying is voluntary and it's designed, like most voluntary codes, to exempt those who uh, institute it from some form of responsibility. I get that bit, but then why have a banking ombudsman at all if they can't enforce um, some degree of moral probity upon those banking institutions? Yes, yeah, so I think, again, that's why, why we need stronger rules. We need mandatory things in place that would give us the protections, which would then give the ombudsman, you know, the ability to, to have more teeth because they would have these rules that, that they can really check. Whereas at the moment, unless it is an unauthorised payment, there's not really much that they can do. So our argument here is that, you know, under, under the Consumer Guarantees Act, the bank should be acting with reasonable care and skill. And, and our argument is that the banks are far, far more kind of inclined to be able to spot a scammer than you or I or anybody else that, that gets these, these messages. But, but right now, the rules are just not there to, um, to enable the, the ombudsman to, to act. And it's so, a huge source of frustration. Well, listen, I understand so. Um, so the cons I don't know who the consumer minister is. I must admit I, that piece of information is beyond me. I'm assuming they're right yes, in the Andrew government. Andrew Bailey. Andrew Bailey, okay. Yeah, Minister Bailey, yeah. Um, so I assume you have or your organisation has had this contact or communication with him? 
Yeah, you know, what was quite reassuring is in February this year, Minister Bailey did, did start making noises about this. And he's written to all the banks and wants, said that he wants them to take immediate action to provide better protection to consumers. And um, on the one hand, this does sound good because they're exactly the kind of things that we want to happen. But he supports an industry-led approach and he's given them some quite generous timeframes to, to what we would call step up. And so although this is, this is progress, we are worried that, it, that it's too slow and that a kind of self-regulatory system is not the answer here. So um, this is something that we will be making more noise about. At the moment, we're just kind of we're gathering evidence. That's why we're doing our surveying to, to get a grip on the problem. And we're talking to, to more people about just how big a problem this is. You know, for example, there is no kind of agreed figure on what the scam loss in New Zealand is. So the Ombudsman and MB put the figure about $200 million a year. And then towards the end of last year, NetSafe put out a report saying the figure was $2 billion. And, you know, the, the difference between those two numbers is obviously staggering. But we also know that scams are hugely underreported because people, they feel an element of shame if they fall victim to a scam. And so chances are that $200 million figure is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. And so... I, I mean, it's just—it's a huge, a huge issue. The, I mean, there are people listening to this though going, um, "Well, wait on. Uh, they are sophisticated criminals. Um, yeah. They have managed to convince you. So it's a crime that's committed yeah. against you as the individual to part with um, information and." That, that really they shouldn't have parted with. Um, ultimately, the responsibility rests with that individual. Why does it rest yeah. with the bank? What would your argument be to that? 